Jeff, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me, TK. Good to see you come out. Uh, happy to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. It's, it's real good to see you, brother. So I, I'm, I'm curious just what's going on right now. What's happening in your work that you're excited about and that you're focused on uh, during this quarantine? Um, what's happening in this moment right now is uh, my team and I are working through a rebrand. And I think that pandemic, quarantine, the world changing is an opportunity to reinvent oneself. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's the invitation that I've received, which is um, you can accept the changes that are already happening in your life. Uh, there's a poet that I follow, a guy named David White, who's an Irish poet. And he says that most of us are two to three years behind the curve of our own personal transformation. What he means by that is that it takes us like a couple of years to catch up to the fact that we've already changed. So when I talk about a rebrand, what I'm really talking about is the visual, the external representation of internal change that has been happening for years now. And, and that's my experience. I don't know what you guys experience, but that's my experience with change, with transition, with transformation. I change internally. I fight it. There's some angst. There's some frustration. There's some fear. And then eventually it all just kind of comes out. I mean, this, this is how I quit my job and started a business. Uh, this is how I've transitioned from one kind of work into another. And now I've been doing this work now for 10 years. And so I'm at a new threshold where I'm thinking about the next 10 years, what does that kind of look like? What's going to be different? What's going to stay the same? And a lot of these changes have been happening internally and, you know, being holed up, uh, you know, in, in a small dwelling place for a long period of time for the past almost year, nine months, what, 10 months almost, um, has forced me to go, what, what really has been changing inside of me for a long time? And how do I want to begin to share some of those changes with the world. And so, yeah, you know, working on a rebrand, which is fine, it's cool. But what I'm excited about it is it is the visual representation and it's going to be the announcement of kind of the new direction of work that I'm taking. Man, this is a really in interesting concept, the idea of, of keeping up with your evolving self. You know, we, we have our own experiences and we change in so many ways. It's obvious to us, but it's easy to keep showing up in the same way for the rest of the world. So I'm, I'm curious to, to, to follow up on that. How the heck do you even maintain that awareness? And how do you know when you should change a brand to accommodate the person that you're in the process of becoming? So... I think that change becomes inevitable. Personal change becomes inevitable when the energy required to stay the same is now greater than the energy required to change. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I know it's time to take the leap, uh, create the change, do, do the thing, whatever it is. I know that it's time to do that when it is requiring, it is more exhausting for me to just maintain this than it is to go do that. And I know that the energy I'm going to receive from the change, whatever it is, because it's always more work than you think it is. Uh, it, it's, it always requires more effort, more time, more resources, more money than you think it will. And so you've got to be getting a lot of life from that, right? And I tend to resist change until it almost becomes unbearable. And then I just kind of go all in on it. And there's so much energy. I had a very similar experience as you did TK, where I was like, I'm not a writer. I'm not a writer. I'm not a writer. And then all these things happened. I had a conversation with Stephen Pressfield. I met Seth Godin. These uh, people who inspired me spoke into my life, whether they realized they were doing it or not. And um, I could not do it anymore. Right. And, and somebody actually told me, you are a writer. I was like, I'd like to be a writer someday. And they're like, no, you are a writer. You just need to write. And, and a switch kind of flipped mm -hmm. in me. And I went from thinking of myself as an amateur to turning pro in my head, which is what Stephen Pressfield says you have to, you have to turn pro in your head before you do it on paper. 
And I went from going, oh, I think I'd like to do this someday to every day getting up at 5 a.m., writing 500 words and publishing it on my blog every single day. And it wasn't a decision as much as it was this thing that was happening to and through me that I had to give myself to. And, and it was just, I, I put built up so much resistance over the years to like, I want to write, but I don't think I can do that. And just kind of the struggle. And then I just like, I couldn't deny it anymore. It felt like a calling. And when I finally surrendered to that, there was all this energy. There was this excitement, this passion. I remember I had a blog for four years and I had 250 subscribers and I was really nervous about quitting that blog to start this new blog. And wow. I quit the old blog, to the new blog. And I said, I'll do it every day for two years. And if I can't get 250 readers and half the time that it took me before I'll quit. And you know, for the first six months, it didn't work. I, I, I had a handful of like 50 readers and I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know. And, but I made a commitment to do it every day for the next two years. And at month seven, I hit an inflection point and I went from 50, 60, 70 readers to a thousand in a week. And then six months after that it was 10,000. Six months after that it was a hundred thousand. Um, but it's interesting. I started this project the way I start every project, which is like, I don't know, and I'm going to try it, but I hope it works. And the first six months were just a slog. And then things just started to take off from there because I kept showing up with the same excitement and energy. And so I, I think that that that's the challenge here. When we talk about starting new things, you've got to bring a lot of energy to the table. And it's got to be sustained energy for a certain period of time. And I think committing to something for uh, two years is a good way to give something a try, right? It's like, it's like, uh, I want to get into shape. So I'm going to like go work out really hard for like a week or two or three. It's like, okay, you're going to see some results, but not the same kind of results you'll see if you do it every day, something every day for the next six months. One, that's going to create a really good habit for you. Two, it's going to build up some momentum. And it, the growth doesn't happen like this all the time. It happens like, you know, nothing. And then it can kind of hockey stick at just the right moment. And I love the magic of that. I love the mystery of it. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm feeling the way now I felt 10 years ago, which is like, I'm scared. I'm scared to give this up. You know, I was scared to give up 250 subscribers for a hundred thousand. Now I'm scared to give up a million for whatever the next thing is. That's really good. Jeff, you know, you said something earlier that I really resonated with, which was, you know, when the transformation has already in, uh, occurred internally before it actually manifests in your life or before you completely buy into the change. And that's something that I can completely relate with, like feeling an internal evolution, but wanting to ignore it or not knowing what to do with it. So how, yeah. how do you get quiet enough with yourself? How do you get in tune enough with yourself to know that this is an actual thing and that it's not just some random thought form or, you know, desire? Yeah. I mean, I think you answered the question in the question, which is how do you get quiet? Right. Um, I, I think for me, first, I have to acknowledge everything is always changing, right? Everything is always changing. It just is. Uh, so we are always caterpillars becoming a butterfly of some sort, right? We're always in a chrysalis becoming the next version of who we are. Our cells are always changing. Our minds are always moving. We're, whether we're aware of it or not, we're feeling all kinds of things in our body. But we are this big ball of energy. We are. We just are. And matter itself is not standing still. Matter is energy that is vibrating at different frequencies it, that that's our universe right now but we live in the illusion that like this is solid and this this is and i'm never changing and i'm the same i and it's like no like you completely different and and the best way to know that is to go who were you five or ten years ago and did you ever imagine your life would look like this and if you did great then predict the next five years if you're like me and you go, nope, I wasn't very good at it, then be open to the fact that change is going to happen. So I think one, Kamala, is just like accepting the fact that 
Everything is always changing. That is the one constant, including you. And what I find is I reach points of stability, financial stability, fame stability, success, stability, whatever, you know, relational stability. And as soon as you've hit stability, you're actually starting to decline. You just don't know. As soon as you've hit a point of stability, you're going to start um, experiencing a decline. Uh, and it'll happen first internally before it happens externally. And so this is the other thing that we don't like to hear is things have to die to be reborn, right? You've got to prune the tree. Every, nature is a wonderful teacher at this. I'm looking outside at, at a tree, right? Like the leaves are turning colors and they're dying. And the only thing that grows without death is cancer. Because we just want to grow, 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 you know? But right before a rebirth, there's a death. Right before the butterfly become, or the caterpillar becomes a butterfly. I know we're men and we probably don't like thinking think of ourselves as butterflies, but it's a beautiful analogy. Like he has to, he or she has to crawl into a tomb. And I don't know if you know the science of this. I, I geek out on this. I think it's really fascinating. When a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, caterpillar just knows. That's the other thing. Just knows that it's supposed to climb up onto a branch and just start eating. It consumes. Uh, it gorges itself on food because it's kind of, you know, preparing for an internal journey, right? Uh, and, and I find that in my own life, I just feel this tug, like everything that used to give me life doesn't anymore. Hanging out with the same people, doing the same things. I'm just like, ah, I just want to get away. And so I'll do the same old things and I won't get the same old feels from it. And so I do feel this desire to kind of pull away. So. I do have to trust that because I can fight it. I can keep showing up, keep doing the same thing. So I have to trust uh, that what's happening inside of me is instinct. There's something true. My soul is speaking to me. I, I'm, there's something instinctual that's saying, it's time for you to go change. You're, you're already actually changing and you don't know it. So go get a little, find a cocoon, right? And so I just, I started to trust that, you know, pulling away. I'm not... I'm not doing this forever. I'm not being a bad friend. I'm, I'm figuring some stuff out. And, and honestly, it, it doesn't have to be some big retreat. It's just um, getting a little bit quiet in my life. Uh, going for daily walks, especially this year, has been a really good practice for me to just get clear. Walking is a somatic process. You're moving your body. You're getting your right side and your left side of your brain to talk to each other. It brings up all kinds of emotion, taps into your memory network. It's just a good thing to get clear. Um, so that's me kind of, you know, being the caterpillar, climbing up onto a branch, creating a, a, a cocoon. Now what happens in the cocoon, in the chrysalis, this is gross and awesome, is um, the caterpillar starts creating new cells. It starts creating butterfly cells. And the first thing that happens in the body, it's happening internally, what the first thing that happens as the caterpillar creates butterfly cells, you know what happens? The caterpillar cells kill the butterfly cells the old me kills the new me when it's just getting started so when you begin to change when you begin to evolve the first thing that will happen is you'll kill it go nope i don't do that i don't want to do that i don't like that you'll sabotage it you'll fail you go i tried it didn't work you know I, I don't need to do that see i tried it didn't work i'm gonna go back to this thing something will happen that will that will sabotage the new thing that's happening. Or you'll just deny it and go, nah, 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 nah. So the old always wants to kill the new, but the, but the butterfly cells keep coming. And eventually the, the butterflies overtake the, um, the caterpillar cells and it becomes the caterpillar and it emerges from the chrysalis. Now here's the thing. If you were to walk up to a, a chrysalis on, on a branch somewhere and you were to cut it open in the middle of this transformational process, it would come out as this ooze, like it would it would kill the process. And so uh, I have begun to trust these moments of going in before I go out. So that might mean I make a little bit less money. It might mean I'm a little bit less social, a little bit less active in my work. And it looks like something is dying. And in a way it is, uh, I'm losing momentum. But I feel the energy 
happening. Like I can feel like I'm getting excited. I'm getting clear on some things. And so I trust, you know, the same way that the caterpillar kind of disappears from the world for a while and something new is happening. And I try to not disrupt that process because if you cut into a chrysalis, whoa, it's gross, it's messy. So it's a messy internal process, but it's contained. Uh, and then you emerge as something new. And so the container for me is getting up every morning and before my day starts going for a walk. Because I've got responsibilities, I've got things to do. I can't just you know go to the, the Himalayas for six months or something. Like I've, I've got to create the container of transformation for myself before I go, hey world, this is what's going on. I think that that's a really good question because I don't, in the, in the world today, everybody's sharing their behind the scenes. And I think that can, that's cool. But we have missed the art of disappearing from the world so that we can become someone new and then re-engage with the world in a new way. Because if we don't do that, we're constantly interacting with a world that reminds us of who we were. And, and that's why I think things like totems are really important. Uh, you know, whether it's, you change your look, you change how you dress, you carry a rock in your pocket that means something to you, you got a necklace, uh, a pair of glasses that you don't need. Uh, Todd Herman talks about this in his book, The Alter Ego Effect. We can create physical reminders of internal change that has happened. And that's, that's actually really important. So as you change on your journey of becoming you, it's okay to, to, to change a look, to change a field, to rebrand a website. Those are external reminders of, of internal change. You know, I'd like to juxtapose that with something that you talked about in your book that I also thought was really fascinating. But it's, it's the concept that a thriving artist um, works in public and not in private. And so I yeah. kind of like to hear, you know, um, explain the difference between these two phases and, and, you know, how each has its place. Yeah. So I think the best way to get better at something is to do it in public. And, um, we have to understand that performance is a different kind of practice. And um, so on one hand, as you noted, I mean, these can sort of be contradictory. On one hand, we need to go away and disappear and become something new. And on the other hand, we've got to, we've got to practice in public so we do our best work. And, and so practicing in public for me was something that I learned as a teenager, learning how to play the guitar. And for years, six years, in my basement, playing guitar, learning, you know, Led Zeppelin songs and Beatles songs and Nirvana songs and like becoming pretty good. And then I joined a band and I toured the country for a year. And I got better in that one year of performing every single day. Some days we would play five shows in one day. And I got better that one year of constantly performing. I never practiced. We were just always playing shows. Uh, I got better in that one year than I ever thought I could ever be a guitar. I got better in one year than I did in the previous six or seven by practicing in public. So um, it's interesting, right? So I spent a year becoming really, really good at playing guitar. And then I got to the end of the year and I overheard a conversation between a couple of bandmates. And one of the guys said, man, if I couldn't play music, I don't know what I'd do. And he, when he said that, I thought, I would just do something else. And I knew in that moment that I was not supposed to be a professional musician because the truth is being a professional musician is like 12 hours of 12 hours a day of driving. Like it was me. I, I was the, uh, the adult in the group. I was 24 and the rest of us were 23, 22, 21. We we're out of college, out of high school, 18. And I was like, all right guys, like, you have to get up and be in the van by seven o'clock this morning so we can drive 12 hours to Utah to, you know, play some school assembly or something. And so it was 12 hours of administrative work for, four, for a 45 minute show. You know, it wasn't like glamorous. And my escape that year was writing. I would write a weekly blog post and share what we had done that week. And it became this life giving thing. So um, how do you juxtapose personal transformation with practicing in public? I think it's a wonderful question. Um, practicing in public reinforces your commitment. 
to a craft that is important to you that will allow you to reach mastery. You cannot reach mastery without practicing in public, which is to say, you can't do all your work in private and know that it's your best work. You've got to put some stuff out there, whether it's sharing a poem on Instagram or a video on YouTube or a publishing a book or you know producing a song or whatever it is. At some point, you've got to put your work out in front of people who may not like it so that you can, you can do that thing that every artist has to do, which is deal with the criticism, the misunderstanding, even when people like you, right? Like, oh, I like this. You're like, oh, that's not, that's my old stuff. This is my new stuff, right? That's not, that's not me anymore. The, the, the true professional has to put their work in front of the public eye if they want to reach mastery. But practicing in public can never, can only tell you what you've been. It can't tell you what you're going to be. And so for me, I became a really good guitarist. And that effort of practicing made me realize, I don't want to keep practicing this. I want to do something else. And I had to let go of that. Another example would be Bob Dylan. Uh, Bob Dylan, uh, at what could have been the height of his career as a um, uh folk musician had this exhausting in, in the 60s, I can't remember the year, uh, he had this exhausting tour throughout Europe. He, I mean, he was Bob Dylan. He was the man, right? Uh, and he was the voice of a generation. And he comes back from this um, experience and he's exhausted. And so he goes on a little retreat and he doesn't even take his guitar with him. He goes to some um, rural place in upstate New York. And he goes and he stays in a house for a few days. And he wants to write a novel. He has decided he is done with music. He's so exhausted with music, he's going to write a novel. And he starts typing, and then uh, it doesn't, it's not really going that well. And then one night he gets hit with what he calls the ghost. And he starts writing on a piece of paper. He writes 20 pages of lyrics. And those lyrics become the song like a Rolling Stone. And this launches him into his next season of creative output. He, he goes electric after that. He completely changes his look, his sound, his style, and he has decades of music ahead of him. I think that it's a really good, I mean, that's a really great question because you need both. You need the hustle, the practice, like the craft. You've got to be able to do what TK did. And she like, look, this wasn't about getting a million followers. This was about him doing the work every day to prove to himself that he could do it and actually like get good. And we've got to be able to do that. We've got to be able to accept the invitation of the work, which is you got to show up for a long time and nobody's going to care. And that's, that's just part of it. And we have to be willing at certain seasons to step away from who we think we are and the work that we've created to get something new, to connect with the ghost, you know, whatever you want to call it. I mean, that's, that's how you go from practicing in public is about incremental growth over time that leads to mastery. That's wonderful. But stepping away, getting quiet, recreating yourself is what I call it in the book, the rule of recreation. Artists are not born, they're created. You create your life. The first creation that you make is yourself. And we're constantly recreating ourselves and, and going deeper into that, which is how you get really, a really interesting body of work instead of just different versions of the same thing. And, and I am personally interested in, in that kind of work, you know, um, something that's a, a Seth Godin or the Beatles or even like a Dr. Dre, like it's interesting. It's not just one thing, it's a business and it's music and it's, you know, producing music for other people and it's, it's a look and it's, a, it's lots of different things. I love that. And, you know, the, the most uh, inventive visionary people in culture are often jumping, genre, they're crossing genres, they're crossing disciplines, they're modern day Renaissance people. And you don't, you don't get that unless you step away from the thing that you've done. Even like, you know, like iPhone, right? You guys make computers. You don't make phones. We take that for granted today. Like what other computer? Dell wasn't making phones. 
You know, like you have to step away from the practice for a minute to consider something new. And if nothing else, maybe like Bob Dylan, it's like, oh, now I just have clear focus on what I'm going to do with this work. And I'm not doing it as an obligation. I'm, I'm doing it as a, new, a renewed commitment to the next season of my work. So I think you need both. <laughs> Man, this, this is such good stuff, man. So I've got about, we've got about 10 minutes left with you and I got to okay. get you to talk about this money because I, I think, no, everything that you're saying is just absolutely amazing. But I, I, I think you have a lot of interesting and unique things to say about the relationship that the artist should have to money. And I know there are just a lot of people who they have these creative ambitions, even if it's not to be rich or famous, and the absence of financial resources seems to be the thing that stops them. I want to be a YouTuber. I can't afford a nice camera. Um, I, I want to write, but I'm, but I'm working all the time at a job that I hate just to be able to pay the bills and I don't have time to write or whatever it may be. Like, how does the artist deal with the financial problems that seem to get in the way of creating? So the basic argument of real artists don't starve is that, um, the starving artist myth is a story and myths are stories that we tell ourselves to help us make sense of reality. Right? So there are, uh, American myths, George Washington chopped down a cherry tree, right. And, 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 and told, and told the truth about it. Right. That's a myth. That's a story. Is it true? Is it not true? It's not meant to be true or not true. It's meant to communicate a lesson. And myths are the same way. And the myth of the starving artist is that way too. And in the book, I, I tell the, the story of the story, which is that artists didn't always starve or suffer. In fact, in the Renaissance, starting with Michelangelo over 500 years ago, artists were very wealthy people. And Michelangelo made it possible. He wasn't an outlier. He was the first one who kind of broke the glass ceiling, but he made it possible for many other artists in the Renaissance to be wealthy. And he set a new precedent, which is that you could make incredible art and have a lot of money and, and that those two didn't oppose each other. You just had to know how to play the game. So um, I think the first thing that we have to understand is the idea of the starving artist, that the idea that art and money don't go together is a more modern invention. It's an idea. And you, you can choose to believe it or not. If you choose to believe it, it ends up becoming true. And if you choose to believe something else, that ends up becoming true. And there's a whole undercurrent, as you guys are aware, I think, of thriving artists, of creatives who are making a living. And, and you don't have to be like Taylor Swift or, you know, Bono or Kanye to do it, right? Um, you've just got to have the right mindset. You have to understand the resources that are available to you. So uh, first, I would say that being a starving artist is a choice, not a necessary condition of doing creative work. How do I know this? Because I know, I know literally hundreds of creatives who don't have a record deal, who don't have a publishing deal. They're independent people that are making uh, a good living, you know, multiple six figures a year off of their art. Uh, what's the difference between the starving artist and the thriving artist? Mindset. Now, when we talk about money, um, I think my experience of creatives who have decided to master the field of money, it, 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 because it is a field, they have to acknowledge that, um, that things only have power when you give them power. So if I'm really afraid of money and I'm really afraid of not having enough, I'm giving it a lot of power. And the most lucrative creative professionals I know are not slaves to money and they're not afraid of it. They really understand money as an idea because it is hmm. money's not real. I just met with my financial advisor. I said, money's not real, right? He goes, no, money's not real. It's an idea that we all collectively agree. Like it's not real. We live our lives by it. It becomes real, you know, uh, but it's not real in the sense that I can like there, there are, I log into a screen and there are numbers on that screen and that's my bank account. Yeah. That's my net worth. Right. And if those numbers go up and down, it affects my life. It's connected to reality, but money really is an idea. Uh, you could look at it, the value of the dollar every day fluctuates. So what is a dollar? It's an idea. 
right? It's an abstraction of this collective agreement that we have that we're going to exchange these pieces of paper or pieces of plastic or information. We're going to give an exchange value. Fine. It's an idea. Okay. And creative people know more about ideas than anyone. So the very fact that artists who create things all the time are afraid of money is silly because you understand that you can make something out of nothing like that. And yet you're afraid of this idea, this collective agreement that we, we said, like, if you have enough of these green pieces of paper, you, you get a bigger house. And if you have fewer than, than, than them, you don't. So my challenge to creative people who are afraid of money, because I've been there before. I grew up with very little, you know, bill collectors calling all the time. We got, if we were lucky, like a new T-shirt, you know, to start the school year. Like that was our new set of school clothes. I was like, hey, I got a new T-shirt. This is great. Uh, and I never thought of myself as poor. But I grew up with very little. And so I was like, I'm going to have to work really hard. and Nobody's going to nobody's going to give me anything. And so I still have a little bit of that fear. Like there's never going to be enough that I'm always going to I might be broke. So I've got to hustle extra hard. You know what I'm saying? And so I have begun to experience the freedom of going, this is just an idea. And maybe I can have fun with this. I can play with this like I would anything. Right. Uh, so one of the principles that I think is, is really important um, that uh, I kind of mentioned in the book, but not completely, is um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a guy named Lewis Hyde who Seth Godin introduced me to who wrote a book called The Gift, and it's about art. And he calls art and creativity a gift economy. A gift economy is where we all make our contributions. We all kind of put stuff in the pot and we all benefit from it. Instead of going, I made this, pay me for it, right? I made, give me money for this, right? Uh, and, and Lewis Hyde says art is a gift, and he tells a story about one of the rules of the gift is that the gift has to keep moving. And I think this is true with money. So you can get paid for your art, and that's actually not the point. And if you get paid for your art, the best thing that you can do is keep the money moving, uh, and I don't want to get too like woo woo or esoteric here, but I do think there's something really freeing about if money's coming in, money needs to be going out, right? If I'm going to hoard it all, mm. it just doesn't work that well. So I'm making investments in my business. I'm making investments in people. I'm contributing to charities. Uh, two years ago, I was really nervous about money. Uh, and I, I was texting a friend about it and she's like, the bomb and, and, and knows she's just like free, you know, you know, people like, I know people who have lots of money and they're not free. And I know people who have no money and they're not free. I like, I want, I want money and the freedom, right? I want both. <laughs> and, um, she said, I said, I'm really nervous about money. She says, you need to give some of it away. I said, I don't have any. She's like, I know give some away. And I was like, you're crazy. You're crazy. She's like, I'm just telling you. It's energy. It's just, it is just an idea. Right. And, and I know it's hard sometimes to wrap our mind around. It's just an idea. She's like, it's just energy. Get it moving. And, uh, and she's kind of, you know, in the woo woo, like you need to do this and the universe will give back to him. Like, fine, whatever, whatever, you know? Uh, and I, I, I write a check to this nonprofit for $250. Cause I'm like, all right, this feels like, okay, that's fine. Uh, it's a, things are tight, but I can, I can pull that off. And that night I come home and there's a, a, an envelope sitting on the kitchen counter from the U S department of treasury. Now I run a business. I, I give the government lots of money and taxes. I open up the envelope. We've paid our taxes and it's a check for $25,000. And, uh, we, you know, it was a tax refund of some sort that we were, we were expecting to pay money. And for whatever reason, I got a, I got a tax return for $25,000. Now, is that just coincidence? Sure, I guess, whatever. I told my friend about it. She goes, yeah, that sounds right. You know, you put it, you put it out there, universe gives you, you know, 10, 100 times back. I will tell you this, what coincidence or not, it allowed me to relax. It allowed me to realize this is just, these are just numbers. These are just pieces of paper. Like it all kind of moves around. My job is to get it moving, to get some of the flow to come in and through me. So that, so that what? I can do more work, right? And so the thriving artist uh, doesn't make art to make money, but disciplines himself in the art of making money 
so that he can make more. Mm. Jeff, man, I feel like every moment has been a mic drop moment. Um, we're, we're, we're gonna, we're, we got like one minute left. Come out. I'm gonna give you that last totally. question, man, because I can pick this brother's brain all day. All right, I, I got one last one for you, Jeff. There, there's an old African proverb that I really like, and it goes something along the lines of, "If you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together." And you talk about something in your book that I really like is that the thriving artist doesn't work in solitude, that they collaborate. And so I'm interested to hear you reflect on that and and just talk about how, um, you know, how if you don't have the resources, the, the financial resources, um, various kinds of other capital, if you don't have that, how is like, how can you empower yourself by working with others, right? How, how can you go far by working with others? Yeah, uh, I'll be quick because I know we're out of time. Uh, join a scene. Join a scene means find a crew of people who are doing work that you want to be a part of. And now here's my warning. This is probably not your like tight group of friends, right? It's probably not people you went to high school or college with, but it's people that you vibe with in a very specific way in regards to work right? It's like you have the same sort of standards in terms of quality or same kind of values, or you just have a similar style. So find a scene, uh, a niche, a group of people, whatever, whether it's a Facebook group or a, you know, you know, some sort of in-person group of that's, you know, happening where you live. Um, but like find a crew of people that are just hanging out and doing, doing work, sharing and uh, help someone. Like really your job is to just show up there and help as many as people get what they want and trust that it's going to take a little bit of time and, and that's going to come back around. And you're not doing that so that it comes back around, but it's just a law of the universe. That's what happens. Uh, I found that the greatest asset I had was just relationships and that if I joined the scene and became known as somebody who helped other people, I didn't have to worry about my reputation and I didn't have to worry about even asking for favors. When it was time, when it was my time, when I, when I needed something, people were asking how they could help me. So find a group of people who are doing work or create one. Um, and it doesn't have to be a large group of people, a handful of people that are serious. And what you will find is as you go farther in the journey, people will start falling off and that's fine. Like when I started this work 10 years ago, I had a big crew of people that were all kind of doing, we we're all blogging and trying to make a name for ourselves. And now I know two people out of 20 that are still in it. And that's like, that's cool. That's how it works. But those two people, like we're, we're close and we're all up kind of at the same level and, and we're continuing to help each other out and, and it's fun. Um, and you know, like there will be guides and helpers that get you from this leg of the journey to that leg, but they, you won't be able to go there. And so just trust that it's not gonna be your your best friends from childhood probably. It's gonna be a group of people that help you get to a certain point and new people come in and some people will go. Find a scene, help as many people as you possibly can. Do that for a year and see what happens.